the Lord bless the reading of his word to us. And we shall explore this passage under the theme, the Son of Man Standing. There was once a famous drama critic. His name was John Mason Brown. And of course, in his career, he had offended many actors by his scathing reviews. And so once he was uh, giving a talk as a guest lecturer in some event, and so he presented his slides and he talked through his slides in the dim room. And what he noticed at the corner of his eye was someone was copying every gesture that he was making. He, he thought he was being mocked by someone who was unhappy with his reviews, and that broke his concentration. He, he got agitated, and so at one point he broke off his lecture and he announced to the whole room that those who weren't enjoying his talk, they were free to leave. No one did. He continued preaching, and that mimicking continued. And rather than looking at his slides, rather than looking at the audience, his eyes were distracted and he was focusing on that mimicry until you know, he could take it no longer. He stopped his lecture, he turned on the lights, and he turned to the one whom he thought was mimicking him and he realized there was no one there. It was just a shadow of his own actions and gestures, and he allowed himself to be distracted, detracted, and he forgot what he was to be about, and he was giving into his flesh. And so, child of God, there will always be opposition in our lives, always, right? The devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, Sometimes the opposition is obvious and external, you know, by the devil's children themselves. Sometimes the opposition is subtle, it is internal, and the devil will use our life events, uh, the devil will use our natural temperament to bother us and to get us to look away from Christ to our detractors, to our sins, to the temptations around us. And so when these things happen, we will give into the flesh. Rather than focusing on Christ and our mission to glorify him, uh, to subdue sin, we're detracted, we're distracted, and we give into flesh. Now, today, we see how a vision of Christ, how when we see the Son of Man standing, how this gives us strength to live for him. How he, standing in the gap between us and God, can give us strength to go through our great trials, helping us to face temptations. So there are four learning points that we can derive from this passage. Firstly, the children of the devil will always oppose the child of God. Secondly, the child of God is strengthened by the Son of Man. Thirdly, the child of God will reflect the Son of Man. And fourthly, the Son of Man will grow his church. So firstly, the children of the devil will always oppose the child of God. Or we can say that the children of the devil, they give in to the flesh, whereas we should not. So when Stephen was preaching the gospel, he revealed the sins of the Sanhedrin. We saw this uh, last week. You know, they were religious people, but they were not spiritual people. Uh, they were people who also didn't understand their own history, how their history spoke about the coming of Christ. And when he came, rather than praising him and following him, uh, they killed him. And so Stephen, in verse 51, if you recall, he told them that they were stiff-necked, unclean in their hearts, always resisting the Holy Spirit. And we saw how his defense was actually an offense. And they responded naturally with anger. You know, when we expose sin, those exposed will be angry. 
when we live a righteous light, shining the light of Christ, when we are living a righteous life, those who are not, they will be offended by our lives. So verse 54, it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So here they were cut to the heart. You know, instead of responding with an admission of guilt, you know, like the people at Pentecost, they were pricked in the heart. They asked, what must we do to be saved? These, they were not pricked, but they were cut to the heart. And the reason for both of these events is the same. The first, they were guilty for their sins, but they turned to God for in repentance. Here, they were guilty of their sins, and they did not want to repent. They refused to admit. In the same way when Jesus, in Luke 6, you know, when he confronted sins, the Pharisees were filled with madness, and they plotted to kill Christ. Here, it is the same thing. They gnashed their teeth. This showed resistance. They would not submit to what they heard. And this phrase, the gnashing of teeth, if you remember your Bible, this is a phrase that is used of those in hell. In outer darkness, there will be gnashing of teeth. And this gives us a very scary picture of what hell is. You know, we, we, we often think, oh, you know, when Christ comes and he judges, then there will be sorrow, you know, among those people who have not come to him. They have realized their sins, they're sorrowing, but rather than that, man in hell will be the most sinful that he ever can be. That is why hell is hell. There will be in hell a full-on rebellion in the midst of everlasting judgment. There will be a gnashing of teeth even though Christ is there in all of his righteousness, the wicked will defile by his righteousness forever. And so here we see that the gospel, it will make people angry until they submit themselves to it. And unless they submit themselves, <coughs> excuse me, unless they submit themselves here, there will be no second chance to submit themselves to the gospel. Because forever, forever in hell, they will be in the most extreme way possible, forever angry at God, angrier than they have ever been for an eternity. Now we see here that there's a murderous outcome of the anger. They were angry and their anger had to be satisfied. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord. So when Cain was angry, when his sins were pointed out, he resorted to murder. Esau also wanted to murder his brother Jacob. Jezebel arranged for the murder of Elijah. And Haman, he tried to arrange mass murder. You know, these people here that I've just mentioned, they're family members, they are nobility. But we see it no different in our passage. These members of the Sanhedrin, they were supposed to be religious leaders. They were supposed to be noble people, but they responded with indignity. They were ignoble. You know, they were high priests, they were priests, noble priestly families, they were learned scholars of the law. They even had this semblance of a courtroom, you know, uh, the high priests, then 35 on one side, 35 on the other side. It was a semblance of law and order. They even had you know, the defense uh, or the opposition giving the charges. You know, they had witnesses, then you had the defense. But once that happened, after Stephen gave his defense, rather than as usually do the jury or whatever, they go to an antechamber, they consult, they deliberate, but there was none of that here. Immediately, they pounced upon him. There was no deliberation, but they pounced upon him to kill him. And notice how they did it. They cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. 
That's a bit comical, right? Imagine if I didn't want to hear what you wanted to say, and I did this. And I went, can't hear you, can't hear you. That is childish, but that is exactly what they did, right? And they rushed upon him like a mob to lynch him. Verse 58 tells us that they cast him out of the city, they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So this was tough business. They dragged him out of the city, and these were likely older, more dignified men, and Stephen was a younger man, and this took strength because they would also have to drag him not just outside of the city, but according to stoning rules, they would have to drag him up a cliff so that they can throw him off the cliff in order so that they can stone him. If you remember, that's what happened in Nazareth. You know, the people of the synagogue were so angry with Jesus that they wanted to throw him off a cliff so that they could stone him. So this is exactly what happened, and it was hard work, and this was the height of summer. It is no wonder why they took off their clothes. They stripped down to the waist and put their clothes at the feet of Saul. Now, this kind of anger, it is no surprise. This kind of effort. You know, Jezebel, she went to great lengths to try and kill Elijah, right? She wouldn't submit. She chased him. This is also the same with Jesus. When he showed his miracles, the people couldn't take his preaching, and they got false witness. They tried to, you know, they, they, they got someone to betray him. So all of this effort is not surprising when people get angry when their sins are exposed. And so here, it is no different for Stephen. They applied much effort to get rid of him. And this reminds us, dearly beloved, not to spiritualize the lesson, but we know that the children of the devil will always oppose the children of God. But we also know that the devil is prowling. If we give in to sin, there's much danger there. He hates us, he hates our souls, and he desires uh, us to give in to the flesh as much as these, his children, gave in to their flesh. But secondly, we want to see how the child of God is strengthened by the Son of Man. In verses 55 to 56, it says, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So here, when Stephen was being stoned, uh, he had a vision of Christ. And when he voiced out this vision, it angered the Sanhedrin even more. Now, some of us here, if we were in his situation, we, we would say, maybe, Stephen, it's not so wise of you to say anything. You know, yes, they're angry with you, they're stoning you, but maybe, maybe there's a chance to save your life. You know, maybe if you just stop preaching, maybe if you don't say anymore, then they'll leave you alone. They'll take pity on you. You know, even as they did to Paul, you know, when he was out of Lystra, they stoned him, left him for dead. They didn't really complete the work. Maybe they'll do that to you. But what did Stephen do? Instead of remaining quiet, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. If anything, this would have sealed his fate even more. But why did he do that? Why? It was because that vision strengthened him. Now, what was particularly interesting is the place where this occurred. He was no longer in the city at the temple, this was outside of the city, not in Zion, not in Moriah, not the place where the temple is. He was in a place of shame where Jesus was also crucified outside of the city, but Jesus was there with him. 
to assure him. Just as Jesus called Abraham out of Mesopotamia, he spoke to Moses on Sinai, not in the promised land. He saved Israel in Egypt. And so wherever Christ is, is a holy place, is a place of refuge. And so here, Stephen saw the vision of Christ outside of the city in all of his glory standing. You know, Isaiah saw the Son of God sitting, his train filling the entire temple, and glory was filling all of the earth, and that was an assurance to Isaiah. And so here, this vision of Christ was an assurance to Stephen that even though he was outside of the city, in a place of shame, where he was being stoned, Christ was there. This was holy ground. And just as that glory strengthened Moses to return to Egypt to free God's people, just as much as this glory uh, strengthened Abraham to leave Mesopotamia and his family, just as this glory strengthened Elijah as he heard that still small voice and then he returned to danger, Stephen, when he saw the glory of Christ, was ready now to return to heaven. It strengthened him. And it also strengthened him because of what the vision meant. There was a meaning there. <clears throat> In the same way, the Sanhedrin was angry because of what the vision meant. So one vision, uh, two responses, because two meanings. So for Stephen, why was he strengthened? He saw the Son of Man standing. Now, when we confess the Apostles' Creed, we confess that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, all right? Now, him sitting, or in Latin, in sessio, you know, does not mean so much a bodily posture. Uh, now, of course, we do know that Jesus is in the flesh, and he is sitting, you know, physically at the right hand of God, but in sessio or, or session, right, as we use for the session of the church, means that Jesus is ruling from his throne in heaven, you know, having equal power as God's regent, the king of kings, the lord of lords, you know, the sovereign ruler and judge over all creation. But here, Jesus is standing. So, in one sense, rather than referring to Christ's kingship in sitting and ruling, the posture of Christ's standing was referring to Christ's role as a mediator, as a priest, because we are told in scripture, the high priest stands before God, representing the people to God and representing God to the people. He stands with his arms outraised in prayer before that altar of incense, mediating and interceding for his people. And so that vision of Christ standing to the apostle or to, to, to Stephen was an assurance that Christ was praying for him, even in this moment of greatest need. And while the high priest was just a human guy who would die, who was imperfect, Christ, as the great high priest, was perfect in his intercession. And this gave him strength, knowing that his salvation was secure, his sins had been forgiven, he was loved eternally by Christ, and even at this moment of impending death, his destination was sure. His destination was secure. But also with Christ standing, it strengthened him because of what it meant apart from intercession as a high priest. He knew, therefore, that vengeance was at hand. And this was something that the Sanhedrin also knew. Remember, one vision, two responses. The Sanhedrin knew what he was trying to say and what the implication was. The, this title, Son of Man, uh, contrary to popular belief, 
You know, this was Jesus' favorite phrase or title that he referred to himself. It does not mean that Jesus, uh, that it was referring to Jesus as a man. But this phrase, son of man, being used also in Daniel, this refers to God himself coming in judgment. So the phrase son of man referred to Christ coming in all of his power, right, to judge the living and the dead. You know, in Mark 14, when Jesus was on trial, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And this was him alluding to Daniel 7, where Daniel said, you know, he had a vision and he saw one in heaven as a son of man uh, coming in the clouds of heaven, coming as the ancient of days, that he would come with dominion and glory, that he would destroy all the nations of the earth. So this phrase, son of man, speaks of Christ in his dominion. And so when Stephen mentioned that, it brought great anger, right, to the Sanhedrin, even as it brought comfort to him that Christ was soon coming in his vengeance, and it brought anger to the Sanhedrin that they, of all people, as religious people, should be judged. How dare you? But in that one sense, it did happen. All that Stephen said, that the temple will be destroyed, that the laws will come to nothing, that the ceremonial laws would no longer be able to be performed because the temple was to be destroyed. It all happened. You know, 30 years later, when the Romans came in AD 70, and what we learn from historical accounts is that when they came, they destroyed the temple. The priests, they were butchered. And it was Josephus who said, who reported that the massacre was so bloody that the priests' blood mingled together with the blood of the animal sacrifices that you could not tell the difference. And so this was the vision that he had, and this strengthened him. But thirdly, and lastly, we see how the child of God, sorry, not lastly, thirdly, we see how the child of God will reflect the Son of Man. Verses 59 to 60, when they stoned Stephen, they called upon God saying, and he called upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You know, Stephen here was strengthened. He was given assurance that he would be taken up to heaven by this great high priest and that he would be vindicated because this great king would descend and destroy the enemies. But we see here that this assurance caused him to respond not with self-satisfaction. Like, you know, many of us would say, you wait, huh? I'll be good, right? You just wait, it's gonna come to you. It was not like that. He responded as he saw Christ with grace in his heart. Now. Firstly, he responded with the confidence of Christ. When he was going through struggles, when we go through struggles, and we remember that Christ is the Son of Man standing for us, we can respond with confidence as well because he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He trusted Christ as Lord. He knew that death was coming because of his obedience, but he also knew that Christ would receive him. He knew, even though he was outside of Jerusalem, you know, that wonderful place that the Jews respected, that he was not returning to Jerusalem. He was not going to the promised land from Egypt. He was not going to Midian. He was not going to all of these places, but rather he was going to the true promised land. And he believed that Jesus would take him there. And he said here, he uh, he cried out, receive my spirit, in the very same way that Jesus himself cried out to God, right? In committing his spirit to God. And so he believed that absent in the body, he would be present with God. So even in the midst 
of stoning. His death was faithful. And this is what Jesus said. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Jesus did not have his life taken from him. He gave it out of his own accord. And what is interesting here, if we read what has happened in 59 and 60, when they stoned Stephen, when he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, even though the stoning was so bad, he was still standing. How do we know that? Because the next phrase said, thereafter, he kneeled down. Stephen did not have his life taken from him. Stephen gave his life to God in obedience to him. He did not flee away from this suffering because he had the same confidence as Christ when Christ gave his life to God. And not only did he reflect this confidence, he reflected the mercy of Christ. When he was ready, he knelt down. He prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And we know who this sounds like. We know that this sounds like Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And here, Jesus was praying for these Roman soldiers who had crucified him. They laughed, they mocked, they divided his clothing. And he prayed that, and the Lord answered his prayer immediately after his crucifixion. That centurion, did he not look up at the cross and say, surely this was the son of of God. And so here, Stephen himself, knowing that as not just full of the Spirit, but as a deacon who cared for the lives of others, he showed mercy. Here, he was also showing the same mercy as Christ towards his enemies by praying for those who had stoned him. And when this child of God, when this Stephen understood who Christ was, the great high priest standing, interceding, showing mercy, forgiving sins, therefore he reflected the Son of Man. Dearly beloved, when we give in to the flesh, when we are angry, we're more like the Sanhedrin, aren't we? We're exactly like the Sanhedrin in our murderous rage, in stopping our ears rather than being confident in Christ and showing his mercy. But as a result of this prayer, God answered the prayer that he uttered. We see lastly, the Son of Man will grow his church. We see there was growth. Yes, we see it was a result of persecution. Verse 58, it says, They had laid their clothes at Saul's feet. And in Acts 8, verse 1, Saul was consenting unto his death. So we have to look at these two verses together. It was not that Saul happened to be there and they needed someone to jaga their clothing, right? But it says here in verse 1 that Saul consented, Saul approved. And the fact that they laid their clothes at his feet shows that he was some authority. Remember when the early church sold all of their possessions, they got all the money, they laid it at the feet of the apostles. There's an authority for distribution. Here, they put their clothes at the feet of Saul because he was their leader. He was the one who probably led the charge. He was probably the one from that synagogue that Stephen preached at, the synagogue of the Libertines, right? the synagogue of men from Cilicia, whose capital is Tarsus, Saul's own home synagogue. He probably led the charges, and here, consenting to his death, charged Stephen. And as a result, there was great persecution so that all Christians, except for the apostles, they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Paul, or Saul before, made havoc on the church. He devastated the church. Verse 3, he went from house to house because Christians met house to house, and he dragged out men and women to prison. So we learn here many escaped. They went abroad. 
as verse 4 says, as they went, they preached the word. What was Jesus' commission to them in Acts 1 verse 8? You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Church had been operating for quite a while now, but they weren't moving anywhere. Even those who had come for Pentecost, right, Passover, etc., they didn't want to leave. The action was all happening in Jerusalem, and so God sovereignly gave them a reason to go back to Judea, to go and to go forth to Samaria so that the Great Commission can be fulfilled. And it all happened because Stephen laid down his life as a mustard seed, dying and bearing forth much fruit. You know, the Sanhedrin, they did not put a stop to the gospel. In fact, by their persecution, they accelerated it. But this was a work of the Son of Man. His rule is not thwarted. So even though there was opposition, the opposition was in his plan. And therefore, the gospel now was propelled by this band of refugee uh, preachers. But the most remarkable thing I would have you know here is because Stephen reflected the Son of Man in his mercy, the Son of Man answered Stephen's merciful prayer by growing the church in the most bizarre manner. When Stephen said, lay not this sin to their charge, whose charge was this? It was, Steve, it was Saul's charge. And therefore the prayer especially was for Saul and the son of man forgave Saul not long after the centurion in the matter of hours at the cross. Saul in the matter of weeks after this murderous charge. How amazing that the greatest persecutor would become the greatest preacher, that the greatest misanthrope would become the greatest missionary, that the greatest enemy would be the greatest evangelist. So Stephen's prayer here was not save me, rather it was save him. Dearly beloved, don't forget where was Christ when Stephen was being stoned? Christ was there, standing witnessing, seeing everything. But the Son of Man did not stop the persecution. The Son of Man does not stop the temptation. The Son of Man does not stop the children of the devil from disturbing the children of God. The Son of Man does not rescue us from all of our troubles. This is not what the Son of Man always does, but the Son of Man is always there praying for us, watching over us, willing to receive us into his heavenly kingdom. And we who are the children of God because of the Son of Man, how do we face the troubles of our lives? How do we face the flickering, the mimicry, the mocking by being distracted and focusing on those things or on focusing on Christ? that he may strengthen us in our lives. To be sure, to be sure, Stephen was a man full of faith. To be sure, he was a man. But because the Son of Man was able to have confidence in God, and those confident in the Son of Man are too, so can we as we go through our various troubles in life. Let us find comfort from the word here, and may the word of God be applied to our lives. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, and we pray that as we glean these lessons, even as we ourselves struggle with the various sins in our lives, the distractions, the temptations that we have, even as we may experience trouble from others, especially others who are not of your kingdom. We pray that we will have a vision of who Christ is, 
to know that he is our king, he is our avenger, he is our merciful high priest that shows mercy also on his enemies. And therefore, help us too to be like that son of man as we go through our problems to show forth confidence and mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.